Matthew chapter 5. Kind of an introduction to this we find at the tail end of chapter 4, the part that we did not uh, talk about last week. This is early in Jesus' ministry. And he has just gone through the baptism, gone through the being tempted in the wilderness. And if you uh, slip back to the uh, latter part, maybe around verse 12 of chapter 4, you'll find several things have taken place from there to the end of the chapter. Jesus moved. He lived in Nazareth. Uh, he was uh, born in Bethlehem, spent the first few years of his life there, and then some period of time in Egypt, no more than a couple years again. But then as a, as a young boy, he and his he and his parents went back to their hometown, Nazareth, which is up in Galilee, and that's where Jesus uh, lived until his ministry began at about age 30. But we find out in this uh, part of Scripture that he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. Not too far away, but Capernaum, if you look at the Bi at Bible map in the back of your Bible, uh, if you have one of those that have maps in the back, you'll find that Capernaum was a fishing town on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Gennesaret, uh, as it's also known. We find in this part of Scripture that John the Baptist has been put in prison. Matthew doesn't give us details here about that whole episode, but he's in prison at this time. He had been preaching. Lots of people have been going... Uh, to see him, but now in this period of time that, that Matthew is telling us about, John's been put in, pr in prison. And Jesus begins calling disciples to follow him in full-time ministry. Now that's really important to understand when you come to verse 18. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now think about that for a minute. Imagine doing that. Here they are at work. They're fishermen. They're on the job uh, for uh, the Zebedee brothers. They were, uh, it was a family business. Peter and Andrew worked for the same company. We don't know whether they own the company or whether they work for somebody else. It's hard work. You work long days. They're out there working. And all of a sudden, this guy just kind of wanders by and says, hey, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they quit their job at that instant and moment of time and follow him. Really? I'd be a little worried about those guys, right? They seem a little flaky. They seem a little, huh? There's, no, there's nothing here that says that Jesus showed up and there was a glowing cloud around him. And he said, did you ever notice that in all the movies, I haven't seen this latest one to know whether it's true or not, but all the movies I've ever seen about Jesus, he has a British accent. <laughs> Seriously, have you ever noticed that? Always. I don't know if anybody's seen this new one, Son of God, whether he has a British accent or not. Yeah? Is it? A Brazilian accent this time. Cool. Cool. But he didn't just show up and, and, you know, like a voice from heaven of, come follow me, you know, so that everything rocked and rolled and so forth. You see, what's, what's important to understand is if you compare this to the Gospel of John, we find that John and Andrew and Peter are identified in the first chapter of the Gospel of John as having been introduced to Jesus and following him to some extent and experiencing the wedding feast at Cana and other things before this time. 
So this isn't about a rash decision. All of a sudden, God shows up and boom, follow me. Okay, sorry, Dad, you fixed the rest of the nets. We're leaving. No, this was something that they already had encountered Jesus. They already understood. And the idea of it now is they, they understood who Jesus was as much as they could at that moment. We will find out as we go through the gospel that they really didn't understand who Jesus was until after, after he was raised from the dead. But they, they encountered Jesus, but now he says, now follow me. Now follow me. I'm going to change you. I'm going to take what you do and who you are now, and I'm going to change it into something sort of like that for eternity. You fish for fish. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm choosing you and have brought you to this place of calling you to prepare you for this, but now I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He does that in our lives too. He does that in our lives. There will be times when you will encounter the Lord God Almighty in a way where you're saved, you're following the Lord, things are going pretty good, feel like you're, you know, you're okay with the Lord. And he's going to say, hey, I want more. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you set this down? Why don't you lay your nets down, whatever those are, and why don't you follow me full time? Because I've got an even better plan for you. The Lord does that. But it's not intended to be some rash, illogical, irrational decision. The Lord moves in our lives and makes things obvious. When Krista and I moved here to Pittsburgh, to my flesh, this was a move backwards in time for me. I grew up here. I left when I was 18 years old. There's a reason I left Pittsburgh, right? And I felt like all these years later, I'm going to move back to Pittsburgh. Oh, man. But the Lord spoke. He had a plan. And in obedience, we came back, and it has been glorious. It has been exactly what God planned, and more than what we could imagine has happened because of that. That's the way the Lord God Almighty works. We find out in this part of the scripture also that Jesus now is teaching in all the synagogues all throughout Galilee and the Decapolis, uh, the Ten Cities area, and that multitudes are flocking to hear him and also bringing their sick, and he's healing everybody. There's this thing happening. I heard uh, one teaching that um, in this day, up in the Galilee and Decapolis regions alone in the major cities, according to uh, one of the ancient historians, uh, there were probably about 2 million people in that area. So this wasn't just, you know, uh, spread out in a few farms here and there. There were lots of people there, not not big, huge cities or something, but a lot of people. And they're flocking. Multitudes are coming, and they're following, and they're, hey, did you hear about this Jesus guy? You don't hear so good? Let me say it louder. You hear about this Jesus guy? Come, he'll fix those ears for you. Right? I mean, that's what's happening here. Imagine if someone said to you, you know what? I, I, I went and met this guy, and there are a lot of people there, and he just touched them, and they were blind, and bam, their eyes can see. Wouldn't you be, maybe at first in our day and age, going, yeah, there's some kind of scam here. How much does it cost? <laughs> right? Unfortunately, because that's what's happened in our world and in the maligning of the church today. But once you got past that, wouldn't you go, oh, I think I'm going to go check this out. Right? This is amazing. That's what was happening. Multitudes were coming. And now, we come to verse 1 of chapter 5. And notice what it says. It says, And seeing the multitudes, meaning Jesus, looking at the multitudes, great throngs of people, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now let's stop right here and realize what Matthew just told us. This is, we're about to jump into several chapters that are known as the Sermon on the Mount. One of five major pieces of teaching in the Gospel of Matthew with 
Uh, that's the way Matthew constructs his gospel. There are five major discourses, and then there's stories in between about what Jesus did in his ministry. But now we're about to jump into the Sermon on the Mount, and you have to think when you're reading a book or of the Bible or anything, okay, who's there? Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? His disciples. He's not talking to the multitudes. Now, this doesn't specifically mean the 12, because the 12 had not been identified at this point in time. There was a greater group of people who were really seeking to follow him and were more than just a, wow, that's really good. i got to get my cousin here because he needs a new leg. <laughs> These are those that are going, man, there's, there's truth here. This is, this is touching my heart. I, 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 I'm drawn to this. I want to know more. And looking at the multitudes, he sits down, which in that day and age, was the normal posture for a teacher. The teacher would sit, the people would stand, the students. So next Sunday, <laughs> taking all the chairs out, except for one right here, right? No, but that was, that was the tradition. So it's, when it says he sat down, it was him inviting them to come. Hey, looking out over all these multitudes, I need to teach you guys some something. I need to teach you something. Right? That's very important to understand because many of the things that are said in the next three chapters make no sense to someone who is not already seeking to follow Jesus. They just don't make sense. And it actually begins right here at the beginning with the Beatitudes. Familiar portion of scripture. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. First one, last one, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It kind of wraps it all around, and this is the message of Jesus. It was the message of John the Baptist, remember? Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And just in the passage of Scripture that we skipped over in the latter part of chapter 4 of Matthew, it says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went out and he began to teach. And the summary statement is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven and he's inviting people to become part of the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom is very important for us to understand. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is a political entity. In this case, it's not a political entity. It's bigger than that because it's the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. But it is with one ruler, the king. This is hard for us Americans to grasp hold of. We live in a democracy, right? We kicked out the king a few hundred years ago, dumped his tea in Boston Harbor, right? We don't want a king. We don't want our president to be a king. We have things in place in the houses of Congress and the judiciary and everything else to keep the president from being king. We don't like kings. It's part of our heritage in this country not to like kings, right? Well, get used to it. If you want to follow Jesus, there's a king, one. It's not a democracy. It's not a republic. You don't get to elect the king. He is king. What you get to do is choose, will you follow the king or not? Will you serve the king or not? When I invite people to become a Christian, there's, there's lots of different expressions that are used for that. You know, Do you want to let Jesus into your heart? Do you want to confess your sins to Jesus and have him forgive you? And all those things are true. But what I find myself saying more than anything else is, do you want to surrender your life to Jesus? Because that's, in the context of kingship, that's what it is. I'm giving up 
I'm renouncing my citizenship of this world and following this king, and I'm going to follow the king. And now what Jesus is talking about here is he's giving us the nature of a citizen of the kingdom. And it's not what you would expect. Now in the context here, the people are looking for a Messiah. They don't actually live in a kingdom right now. Well, there was a King Herod, but he wasn't really a king in, in the modern sense because he was under the arm of the Roman Empire. He lived in under the authority of the Roman Empire and Pontius Pilate down in, uh, down in Judea and so forth. So it's a whole different thing. And the Jews were looking for a Messiah, one like David, the son of David, who would come and establish the kingdom of God. And many thought of it in terms of a political kingdom as well as a spiritual one. And man, if you're going to have a political kingdom that takes over with military might, <laughs> be careful, Pastor Kevin. When you read some of the stuff about what's going on today, this last week, with the Ukraine and Crimea and so forth, and I'm not going to give in a political opinion on all of that, except to say, I have heard some of the reports and think people that, things that people are saying, including some of our senators and congressmen. If you listened just to what they were saying, they were almost saying, man, that Putin guy, of course, we don't like what he's doing, but he's a good, strong leader. Look at what he did. And look at our president. He's weak. Right? Because when you are following a political earthly kingdom, you want somebody strong. You want a leader. You want somebody who's tough. Someone who doesn't back down. Right? Hey, you're going to come in and take Crimea? Absolutely not. We're not going to let you that happen. Right? That's the mentality in the political world. And here Jesus said, hey, you know what? Blessed are all these characteristics. Huh? In a kingdom, these are the people you're looking for? This is what you want to turn people into? Yes. Yes, Greg Laurie wrote a book called The Upside Down Church. And it's, and it's an interesting book because it talks about the fact of how different the church is slash should be from the world in terms of authority and power and structure. Pastors shouldn't be the CEO of a spiritual corporation. Pastor means shepherd. It means to be the servant. Jesus said, hey, I'm washing your feet, guys. You're dirty, smelly, stinking feet. Because I want you to know that that's what is expected of you to get down on your knees and do the dirty work, not be lifted. Man, that's upside down. What corporation would want the CEO to be going around cleaning the bathrooms? None. It's upside down to our way of thinking. We need to talk for a moment about this word blessed. You know, we talk about blessings and getting blessed and we pray that people would be blessed and we want to be blessed. And, and sometimes we think of that in terms of a momentary, wow, that was really cool for a moment in time. Man, I had chills. I felt good. Stuff was good. Man, I'm blessed. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. It means, oh, how happy or what a state of blessedness. Now listen to this. This is from a this is from a scholar, um, it, but listen to what he says. He says, in the Greek, this word for blessed describes a state not of inner feeling on the part of those to whom it's applied, but a blessedness from an ideal point of view in the judgment of others. Okay, that doesn't mean the person being blessed doesn't feel like they're being blessed, but it isn't just... Me going, oh man, I'm so I, I I really feel blessed today. Things are going great. It's, man, I am so blessed. 
and people hear the testimony of why I am blessed. Standing up here with my grandson, I'm blessed. And you could see that, right? And you could judge and say, yeah, he, he, is, he is blessed in that way, right? That's what it is. It's, it's beyond just a good feeling of everything's okay. It's a state of being that is so demonstrative that others can see it. Oh, man, that's a blessed person. I've known some blessed people in my life. And you can see that blessing. Oh, how blessed. There's one other thing before we walk through these blessednesses. This is not, okay, well, blessed are the, let's see, the, the poor in spirit. That's the crowd over here on the right. And, and, and blessed are the meek. That's the, you, you, meek, we're over on this end, okay? No, this is complete. This is what we all are to be entirely. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. Jot down in your Bible, Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23, where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit as opposed to the works of the flesh. Works of the flesh are the things that you do. Fruit of the Spirit is what grows in our life because of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the orchard of the Spirit. And over there I got my love trees, and over there I got my joy trees, and back there in the back I got my... Uh, long-suffering trees. No, it's the nature of the fruit. There are some teachers that teach that, in fact, all of the fruit, all of the descriptions of the fruit of the Spirit are actually a description of love, which is identified the first, that it should read, uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, semicolon or something, and then a description of what love is from all those other things. It's an interesting way to think about it. Any which way you want to categorize it, it's all to be demonstrated within us. We don't get to choose, well, I've got the, I've got the kindness ministry, but don't, don't ask me to get involved in that long-suffering ministry. That's not mine. No, we are all called to all that. And it's the same thing here. Blessed. You want to be blessed? You want to live a blessed life? You want to become blessed. Then don't go out and try and do all these things. Rather, abide in Christ. And these things, just as the fruit of the Spirit, will, part, will become part of your nature and characteristics of your behavior that people will see, including yourself. Wow. I didn't know I could be so long-suffering. That's what happens. It's the change that happens because of what Christ has done in our lives. So let's take a look at these. The character of a Christian is poor in spirit. Now some, uh, because in Luke, it just says, blessed are the poor. Some have taken this, oh, so it's blessed to be poor. We should take a vow of poverty. And here what Matthew really means is, blessed in spirit are those who are poor. I'm here to tell you that just as, it, as Paul said, uh, it isn't about being poor or being rich. One is more spiritual than the other. So what are you doing in the midst of that? If you are poor in material wealth, how is that preparing you better for eternity? How are you using that to be better prepared for eternity? If you're rich, how are you using that to be better prepared for eternity? That's what it's about. Paul says, hey, I've learned the secret of contentment. I can be happy. I can be content in any state I'm in. I've been abased. I can abound. Either one. I know the whole thing is about I can do all things through Christ. It strengthens me. I abide in him. My life might be called to be sick. My call, life might be called to suffer some tragedy in my life. Johnny Erickson Tato, an, an amazing woman who was an athlete who threw a accident early in her life, 19 years old or something like that, I think, became a quadriplegic. And she's done amazing things in the Lord that she has testified. She probably wouldn't 
and probably couldn't have done except for what God put her through. Did that make it easy? No. No. But God uses all things in our lives for the good. Romans 8, 28. All right? Poor in spirit. That's very important. It's not blessed to be poor. It's not cursed to be poor in material wealth. There's a danger in having material wealth. The, the scriptures tell us about the deceitfulness of riches. Ooh, man, money lies to us. Whether we have it or whether we don't, it lies to us. It tells us if you just had a little more, you'd be content. So do whatever it takes to get a little more, and you'll find your contentment. And a little more ain't enough. So I guess it's a little more than a little more. Talking about being poor in spirit, it's recognizing our poverty of spirituality. It's recognizing that we are poor in spirit. When Peter encountered Jesus at the Sea of Gennesaret the night before what we saw that Jesus said, hey guys, come on, follow me, and they dropped their nets and went. When you look in Luke, it says that what happened the day before the the, that day was that night Peter and his brothers had been working all night, fishing, didn't catch a thing. Jesus asked to borrow the boat, was sitting uh, on the boat for a while and, and teaching, and then in thanks said, hey, Pete, thanks for letting me use your boat. You know what? Go ahead out there, drop nets right there, and you'll catch some fish. Now, number one, you never fish during the day at that period of time in that season on Lake Gennesaret, because you're in a desert environment. It's a hugely deep lake. It was formed by uh, meteors. It's, it's basically a filled up crater, so it's very deep. It, it's, more, it's more of a lake than a sea, though we call it the Sea of Galilee. It's not a sea, it's a lake, right? And because of how deep it is, it's very, very cold. But during the day in the desert, you know, the first several feet get very warm. So what do the fish do? They go down where it's cool. So where do you fish? You fish at night. That's why they were crossing the lake in their boats at night. And, and in the story in Luke, Peter says, um, uh, Master, we fished all night. We didn't catch a thing. And here I've said it often where I'd like to have the audio, the true audio version of that passage of Scripture because then Peter says, but because... You say so, we'll try again. It's a paraphrase. And was that a, but because you say so, we'll go again. Or was it a, well, because you say so, we'll try again. Who knows? The Lord knows. Who cares? Why do I bother thinking about things like that? <laughs> Pray for my mind, would you? Oh, we know the story. He went out, he dropped the nets, and they almost sank the boat with the number of fish. And when Peter came back, what did he say? Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Now, this is a guy who knew him, who was drawn to him because his brother Andrew and, and John down in, down in Jerusalem in, 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 the, in the Judea area, they were disciples of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, hey, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They left John the Baptist and said, we're going there. Started following him. It says Andrew went and got his brother Peter. They had seen, the, they, they were at the wedding feast of Cana. They had seen and heard Jesus. And now Jesus does this amazing thing for him. Reveals himself a little bit more to Peter. And what's Peter's reaction? I got nothing, Jesus. I got nothing. I'm a sinful man. Please go away. Seeing the holiness of God, he saw his own sinfulness. He recognized how poor in spirit he was. I have nothing. I have nothing worthy to give you. But what did Jesus say instead? No. I want you to follow me. I want to hang out with you. I want to teach you how to be a fisher of men. It's that recognition of poverty in spirit. There are some in their spiritual walk who think it's important to walk with authority. 
bragging about their spirituality. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn. This is not, I'm, blessed are you if you're sad all your life. This is mourning, and i got to tell you something. When you come to that place of recognizing your poverty of spirit, you begin to mourn. You begin to mourn. When you recognize how far removed this world is from what God intended it to be at the beginning, that causes mourning. When you recognize that there are people that you know and love who are separated from God, and except for His mercy and grace being applied to their lives, they are separated from God for eternity. It's a reason for mourning. There are, someone gave me a, a, a DVD series to watch, and I felt compelled to watch it. I, I, I'm selective on that stuff mainly because of just my time. But for various reasons, I felt it, it, it important to watch this one. And one of the things that broke my heart about it was the bragging and the pumping up of people politically in a Sunday morning extremely large church service around politics and how, you know, those Muslims, us Americans ought to take over those Muslims and, you know, be tough militarily with Iran and all this stuff. Now, we can all sit around and talk politics and think, ah, oh, we should be tougher, we should be kinder, whatever. It's not what it's about. Right here, right now, when you consider the fact that there are millions of human beings who are following, many of them following not radically, not wanting to blow up the world, but many of them following them because it's the religion of their heritage and fathers, and knowing they are not following the one true God through Jesus Christ, it should break your heart that we have gone so far from the beginning of walking with God in the garden to being so totally removed that recently I got a letter that broke my heart because something I'm involved in has been identified that we can no longer pray or preach. And I'm the one who was doing most of the praying and preaching in this particular group. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to see how far removed we have come from God. Blessed are the meek. This is humility. Not weak. Not blessed are the weak. Jesus was not a weakling. Meekness is controlled strength. It's taking the truth of who you are in Christ and being like Jesus. Paul said it this way in Philippians 2. He said, have this attitude in you. Just, just like Christ, who though being in very essence and quality God, didn't think that was something to be grasped hold of so tight that he couldn't set aside his rights as God and step on this earth and be born and live in this world as a servant and die for our sins. Meekness. That's being willing to let others take the credit, to let others be up here. It's not anything about denying the truth. It's about knowing the truth and applying it as Jesus did, who walked the earth in a backwoods, so to speak, country, not an important area. If you wanted to make a real impression, you should have gone to Rome, done some of that stuff for Caesar in his court, right? But no, here he is, according to the plan of God in Israel, proving that God is faithful in all of his promises. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who have the same desire for doing what is right, that strong and necessary and consistent as a, a desire for doing what is right as the desire for food and drink. 
Wow. Wow. Merciful. In chapter 6, we'll see that he says, if you forgive others your sins, you'll be forgiven. Your Father in heaven will forgive you. He's forgiven you. Why don't you forgive others? Later, Jesus will tell the parable of the guy who owed a million dollars to the king. And the king came in and said, okay, it's payday. Pay up. I don't have it. Please have mercy on me. Ah, that's it. Giving you enough time in, in the jail till you pay it off by working for me. No, please have mercy. Please have mercy. And the king goes, you know what? Forget it. Forget about it. You don't have to pay it back. Right? Let's him go. This guy goes up, sees a buddy of his who owns him five bucks. He says, man, I need my five bucks. Sorry, man. My kids are sick. I, I just haven't been able to do it. You know, I, I, give me some more time. No way, man. Into jail you go. And he throws him in jail. And the king finds out about it, pulls him in front of him and goes, what? Are you serious? I forgave you this huge debt? And you're not going to forgive people some little bitty debt? And the whole point is speaking to us. You've been forgiven of your sins if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And you have the promise of eternal life that began in this world now and will continue on just getting better and better until we're face to face with God. God forgave you so that you could have that. So you can't forgive that person at work because they sneered at you. That's the context of that parable. Merciful. Pure in heart. Without division. Not mixed motives. Not doing something nice to get ahead, to get credit, to get whatever. No, it's pure in heart. The peacemakers. We should be known as makers of peace. We're talking about the peace of the Lord. Now, have to understand the thing that we cannot control the reaction of others to the gospel. And... Jesus says in another place, hey, don't think I came to bring peace on this earth. I, I came to bring a sword. He didn't mean we should go out and start cutting people up. But he said the gospel will divide. It will divide between families. It will divide husbands and wives and fathers from their children, mothers from their children, and it does. And some of you may know that division. But we're not called to go out and slice and dice people with the Word of God. We're called to be peacemakers. To invite people to be reconciled to God and to know His peace. Wow. Yeah. That's what we're called to be. And apart from the Spirit of God, you won't get there. This isn't a list of things to do. This is a list of character traits that the Lord will build in you as you abide in Him. Now the second half of this passage that we're going to look at today, he talks about usefulness. And really begins in verse 11. It says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Important phrase. For my name's sake. Rejoice. And don't just be glad. Be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When you get through all the blesseds, and you can be all of those things in Christ, and you can deal with others in that way, seeking to make peace, being humble, being meek, recognizing your spiritual poverty, all of those things, and your, the reaction that you are guaranteed to some extent 
to receive is you'll be persecuted and reviled. I had an interesting thing happen to me yesterday. I was on the internet looking for something entirely different. I was actually looking for the Calvary Chapel South Pittsburgh website because I haven't had a chance to see it yet. And oh, by the way, for those of you who are wondering, Calvary Chapel South Pittsburgh's first service last Sunday, from all reports I have heard, was just an amazing blessing. Awesome. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? And we have some extra seats now where we can bring in some more smelly fish and clean them. Right? Amen. Start fishing. Start fishing. You catch them, I'll clean them. Deal? I got to tell you one quick story, too, that Tim, that Tim told me. Um, when they first uh, saw the, the theater down there in Elizabeth and realized, man, we, we, we could use this maybe, and they talked to, the, to the, uh, the guy who owned it and could rent it to them, uh, they, they talked about, well, we need Sunday school rooms too. Are there any more rooms besides just the theater area? And the guy said, oh, yeah, there's two more rooms. Oh, awesome. Perfect. So then when they went and took the tour of the whole facility, basically there were two broom closets that were rather large for broom closets, but not big enough for a Sunday school room. And Tim was like, oh, man, what are we going to do? Well, we've got a lobby of the theater, and we've got the theater area. So we'll use the lobby for kids' church, and we'll use the sanctuary for uh, teaching the adults, and we'll do it. I, I hear that they had like 30 kids for... Uh, for the Sunday school in the front. And so the lobby was a little tight, right? Well, I had said to Tim when he first told me about, uh, about the broom closet issue, I said, you know, Tim, the first Calvary Chapel that I went to, what they did was they actually had a separate building. They were renting spaces, but they had a separate building for the kids. So people would go, drop their kids off, and, you know, cross the street building or down the street building or something like that. I said, you know, look around. Maybe there, maybe there's a building right around the area. Where so last week, sometime he took a walk around the area, introduced himself to people, and found a little storefront, and went in and uh, either talked to the guy or made a phone call or however made the contact to to the guy who owned it, and, and, and said, you know, it's for lease, but gosh, we'd just like to lease it for a couple hours on Sunday morning. Are you interested? And the guy said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And Tim said he was just kind of like blown away. And now you got to get down to talking price, right? And he said, well, you know, how much, how much would it be? And the guy said, well, um, would 100 bucks per Sunday be okay? And Tim said, I, I had to stop myself, Kevin, from laughing out loud about how good God is. You know, so I don't know whether it was all put together for this Sunday or not, but God provides, and it's awesome what God is doing. It's a multiplication, not a division, and that is just, uh, it, it, it's such, such a blessing. So I'm on the internet, and I'm Googling, and I'm looking for their website, and I was putting the wrong words in, and nothing was coming up. I'm going, where, where is that? And I'm looking down through the Google entries, and all of a sudden, in the text of one of the Google entries, it says, and my Calvary Chapel, Pittsburgh pastor, blah, 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 blah. I went, hmm. Um, we're the only Calvary Chapel in Pittsburgh. So I guess that's me. So I clicked on it. And I found a site, and it happens to be a site that's this particular site has, and when I looked at the blogs and entry of blogs, and it comes to current, but it dates back at least four years that I saw, it is a site dedicated to naming Calvary Chapel, Chapel pastors, uh, the major ones at, mostly in the Calvary Chapel movement, and talking about how bad they are and how, bad, how they do all kinds of things bad. It's just, I mean, it's one of these just rip them apart. And there was one on one of the Calvary Chapel pastors, and there was this entry from someone who doesn't go to the church here anymore, left years ago, and uh, about, uh, about me and uh, my relationship with this Calvary pastor. 
And you know what the thing that got me, and, and it hit me in the heart, was this three or four paragraph blog entry about me in particular was not true. It wasn't true. I mean, not even kind of fuzzy, not true. It's not true. Boy, my flesh went, oh, man, I am going to set the record straight here, right? Looked at the date on the post. It's like three years old. I'm going, okay, and wait a minute. What am I teaching on tomorrow? Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. Now, some people take this verse of Scripture and seem to go out of their way to be obnoxious and make people revile them, not for Jesus' name's sake, but because they're being weird, right? And you're laughing because you all thought of somebody instantly that, oh, yeah, I can, yep, I can picture that person right now, right? This, we're not called to incite reviling, but it is what happens when we declare the truth of the Word of God and the salvation of the name of Jesus Christ. It's what will happen. And what Jesus says is, look, all these things, that when you really think about it, a person who is humble, a person who is meek, a person who is willing to yield, a person who loves the Lord so much, all this stuff in the Beatitudes, when you think about that, you think, man, people are just going to look at that and go, wow, that's a wonderful person. No, they're not. You will experience persecution and reviling for Jesus' namesake because they reviled him, the perfect person. Don't you think you're going to get some of that too? Absolutely. It's a promise of Jesus, straight from his mouth. They hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But he says here, look, you're blessed if that happens. You are blessed because, well, you know what? You have a reward in heaven for this, and you're in really good company. Think about the prophets. Man, there's the one that was sawn in two. That's some pretty serious reviling. There's the ones who this, that, and everything else. Man, you are in good company. Awesome. Awesome. It is a, it is a little challenging when he says, not just be glad, but be exceedingly glad. Yeah, I need more of Jesus in my life. I need more of Jesus in my life. And then he uses two illustrations to say, look, don't do this in a compromising or half-baked way. Don't say, okay, I'll, I'll try this, but, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to be meek and I'm going to serve other people but I, I don't want to offend people by the name of Jesus, so I'm just going to do these good things, and and um, I, I'll I'll let my goodness shine through to people, and that will that will attract people. Jesus said, "Look, you're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth." In the day, of course, salt was used as a major preservative, not having refrigeration. It was used for flavoring. There's another interesting application. The Roman soldiers used salt. Each soldier was given a portion of salt. It was called the sal salarium. I, I, it's Latin, and I don't know Latin. It's something like that. It, but it's the word from which we get salary. You're paid a salary if you have a job. That's where that com comes from, from that word. And they were given a portion of salt, and the reason was if they were wounded, they weren't sent back to the, you know, naval hospital or whatever in the back. No, you took the salt and you packed it in the wound for healing. Now think about that a minute. Ooh, man, give me some salt in that wound, right? But you see the Dead Sea salt, this is interesting, out of God's judgment of Lot and the whole area down in the Dead Sea becoming dead because of the salt and so forth. Salt is mined there, and it is so pure that it can be used as an antiseptic. 
It can be used in various ways that common salt has to be treated today to be used. So they use that for healing. You, me, we're the salt of the earth. We're the ones that are here for the healing of people's lives, for the wounds that they have encountered in this life. And at first, it feels like salt in a wound to them. Ah, what do you mean, Jesus? I don't want that. I, I want my job back. I want my wife back. I want this. I want, I want my health. And we're saying, no, you need Jesus. And they're going, no, leave me alone. I want these other things. But that salt brings healing to the wound. But when the salt loses its saltiness, if it loses its antiseptic nature, in that day what they would do with it is they would spread it basically for paths. It would keep the vegetation down. I'm going to kill all the weeds on this path. I'll just spread salt. The rain comes. It dissolves, kills everything. We got a nice little pathway here. Today, well, drive around Pittsburgh today. You will see salt all over the roads, right? The stain of that salt from these months of uh, snow and ice, right? We throw it on the road. You wouldn't pick that up off the road and season your dinner with it, would you? No, it's dirty. It, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't have that nature to it. And we... If we lose the full-on, complete characteristics of what Jesus just said, man, we're just we're just getting we're just good for throwing out. We're not good for seasoning. We're not good for healing anymore. He says, "Look, a city on a hill cannot be hid." Now, there's an interesting thing about if you sit on the shore of Lake Gennesaret near Capernaum. There's an area where some believe some of this, uh, certainly some of Jesus' teaching, maybe this particular uh, portion was taught. But as you look off, there's a very high, very high hill, small mountain, like a, you know, a Mount Washington plus another couple hundred feet height, you know. And there's a city right on, on, right on the edge of that hill. And at night, if it's really dark, no light pollution back in the day, you know, and you're out there fishing, if you lost your way and you couldn't see the stars, you could see that city, and it was a spot that was a, like a compass point for the fishermen. He says, you can't build a city on a hill and hide it, right? You don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket because you don't want anybody to see that light. And then what does he say? Look, let your light so shine before men, real important, that they see your good works, okay? That whole thing I said at the beginning about, well, let's just do good works and let them, you know, and that'll be good. That's all good, but you got to catch the second part of what he says here. That they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father in heaven. If you don't tell them you're doing those good works because of Jesus, they're going to go, wow, you're a really great person. I wish I was more like you. Boy, you're so good. I'm going to tell everybody about how good you are. I just I, I I'm gonna write I'm gonna write an article for the paper and put it in there. You know that one second page of the Post Gazette about people that good do good things, and all the glory is going to you. All the glory is going to you. And boy, it feels good. So you might go, oh, yeah, I am pretty good, aren't I? <laughs> Watch out, God will bust you on that, guaranteed. I can testify to that by experience. No, but so that they see it. And they know that the reason for that is because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. So we're not just out there speaking, but there are feet. There's feet to our faith. There's action to our faith that gives people the stamp of validity that I'll, I'll never forget. My friend John, who's been living with the Lord for several years now, in the basement of the church in Elliott, where we met for a time as this church. And after church, we had to redo everything and move the tables around for uh, Meals on Wheels for the other church and so forth. And man, you had to get out of the way after church was over because the congregation just, okay, boom, let's do it. Stack the chairs, get the tables off, boop, boop, boop. You get out of the way. And John was standing there and he goes, you know, this is amazing. He said, you people really believe this. 
And he said that because he saw the actions that people were doing. He heard the word, but he saw the actions as well. Let your light so shine before men, not to gain glory for you, not to feed your pride, but so that they might see those good works and go, wow, this Jesus person is for real. God calls us as citizens of his kingdom to be blessed. And he blesses us when we walk in this way. There's a link between the fruit of the Spirit and these characteristics. Go back and look at Galatians and see how that molds together. And don't go out and try and do them. Instead, abide in the Lord and choose Him and you will find these things becoming a description of who you are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is so rich. It's so filling, Lord. It fills us with your spirit. Directs our path. It is a light for us to know the way to go. Lord, help us to become characterized by these behaviors and characteristics. Let us be fruitful trees bearing the fruit of the Spirit in all of our ways. Help us, Lord. It is by your Spirit's action in our lives. We give you free reign. We do surrender to your kingship and ask that you as king would change us to become more like you. Lord, help us this week to be able to identify a place in our lives, in our day-to-day -day life, where at least one of these characteristics is needful and give us the strength and the direction and the ability by your Spirit to walk in your way. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ who is our Lord and he is our Savior and he is our soon coming King. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.